This week on The Climate Show, can we catch climate heating carbon dioxide from places like this before it gets into the atmosphere or even draw it down once it's there? Hello and welcome to The Climate Show, where we're all about trying to clean up heavy industries. I've come to a cluster of such businesses across North Wales and the North West. And this one behind me is a cement plant which is planning to take out the carbon dioxide before it goes up into the air. We'll also hear about one project in Morocco that believes growing algae in the desert can help remove carbon that's already in the air and tell you about why some people are calling this charcoal-like substance black gold. But first, this is the problem, an industrial chimney. This one emits about one million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year and it's attached to an energy from waste plant. The idea of carbon capture and storage is that we could take that carbon dioxide out of the smoke and fumes, compress it, and then store it safely. But it is hugely expensive, just massive as a project, and many people say it would be better to just not have those dirty industries in the future. Everywhere you look here, there are polluting industries. Chimney stacks and refineries line the Mersey estuary as far as the eye can see. Important to our economy, but damaging for our environment. That's why it's been chosen as the UK's first carbon capture cluster, known as HiNet, capturing CO2 before it's released into the atmosphere. Just over the way there, you can just see a power station. David Parkin is the project's progressive director, working with around 40 companies to capture their CO2. Why here? So this region's got one of the biggest concentrations of industrial emissions but we've also got really important geology for being able to store carbon emissions deep under the seabed offshore. Is this not just an excuse for dirty industries to carry on polluting? No, I disagree with that because these are all industries which allow us to live our life every day today. So the energy from waste plant where we are today, that's gathering waste from all around the UK and that's going to continue operating in the same way for 40 years. So being able to take the carbon dioxide from there and store it responsibly is a really important part of what we're about. The plan is to capture CO2 that's currently being emitted by heavy industry in the area by capturing it from the chimney and compressing it in tanks before storing it in a depleted natural gas field beneath Liverpool Bay. Carbon capture has long been touted as a solution for hard-to-halt emissions, but despite big promises, precious little has actually been built. So what's the difference this time? Well, it's front and centre of the government's legally binding commitment to reach net zero by 2050, and they've committed £20 billion for the technology over the next two years. It will definitely happen this time. The legislative backdrop has changed. We're in a net zero world now. We cannot not do carbon capture and storage. The government's really serious, and yet we had some delays last year because of political instability, but we're right back on track. This power station runs on rubbish. One grab can hold seven tonnes but burning it does create a lot of carbon dioxide. Those ducts take all of those flue gases up our stack, our lovely 100 metre stack, and currently we emit all of those to the atmosphere, including all the CO2 inside. Down the bottom here we have the flue gas ducts. What we'll do is we'll divert all the gases that currently run through those flue gas ducts. We punch out across the road to the neighbouring site, you can see in the background, so everything that's there gets demolished. So all those chimneys will go? All those chimneys will right. go in the near distance. New carbon capture facility goes in, and what we do, we run the flue gases through that facility. We've got what's called an amine solvent, that strips all the CO2 out of those flue gases, holds on to it. Then we take that solvent somewhere else, heat it up, and it releases the CO2 as a pure stream, which we then pipe out into the Liverpool Bay, and we store it underneath the Liverpool Bay. We're talking about spending in the region of half a billion pounds on a site that is going to take up everything you can see between here and the salt works behind there. So uh, it's going to be big infrastructure. It's about the same size again as actually the energy recovery facility behind us. Wow. Another big climate culprit is cement, responsible for 5% of all emissions. 
This is pretty much the core ingredient for cement, calcium carbonate. But to make it into cement, you need to separate the carbon bit of that off. And that combines with oxygen to make carbon dioxide. So the emissions from this aren't just in the heat, they're in the very chemical equation itself. This is Padeswood Works, just over the border into North Wales, and they intend to become Britain's first cement plant not to emit carbon dioxide within five years, by also linking to Hynet's carbon capture network. Getting very familiar with galvanised stairways today. So why have you brought me up here next to this massive metal pipe? So this is the kiln that is uh, crucial for making cement. So this is where we heat the, the limestone at a very, very hot temperature. Gases in there can be up to 1,800 degrees. And at the moment, all the CO2 from both the heat and also the chemical reaction, where does that go? So at the moment, it goes into the atmosphere through the tower on, on the chimney. Our intention is to, to capture 800,000 tonnes of CO2, which will be 100% of our CO2 uh, emissions from, from our page of cement works. And we're constructing a sort of 400, 450 million pounds carbon capture plant on the field adjacent to our, our plant works. So our intention is to have it operating alongside our current cement works. When will you be able to look me in the eye and say the creation of cement is not contributing to global warming? So at this facility in Paidswood, uh, I will be happy to invite you back in 2027, 28, where our carbon capture facility will be operating and we'll be capturing 100% of our emissions, so 800,000 tonnes a year of CO2 from this facility. It's a date. <laughs> One of the criticisms of CCS is the huge new industrial construction it needs. Here, they're reusing some infrastructure of the past. There's no point in capturing carbon dioxide if you can't store it somewhere safe. Italian energy company Eni operates gas platforms just offshore in Liverpool Bay. We go to our, our site, which is... One of their gas fields is now empty, so they're planning to use that as the CO2 lockup. Has this worked anywhere else in the world? Yes, it does in several places, and it has worked for safely and securely for, for, for years. There are now currently about... 42 million tons of CO2 stored per year in the world, most of it in the, in the United States. But there are also in Europe, in Norway, for instance, we are partner of one of them, yeah. which has been operating since 95. I mean, is this a kind of survival technology? Absolutely not. Let's make it clear. We are now offering the possibility of, to other to third parties who are emitting to decarbonize their activity. So what we're doing here, we are offering this as a as an opportunity for economy in this place to continue. I suppose that's what concerns some people. They think that carbon capture and storage is more about the survival of dirty industries than it is about the survival of the planet. I think it is very much one of the components for an essential component, like the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change says, is an essential component for the, uh, for the continuation of the activity and for man maintaining the uh, global warming within the 1.5 degrees. So it is an essential part to continue the activity. The products made by the companies in this cluster, glass, cement, even breakfast cereals and crisps, are likely to be in demand for many years to come. But cleaning them up requires a whole new and massive industry. Hynet's vision is for carbon capture clusters to spread across Britain and the world. But realising that vision comes with a huge bill. And after so many false starts and so little infrastructure built, many are still questioning if it will ever happen. As we've seen, there are plenty of efforts going on to try and remove the carbon dioxide from the chimneys of heavy industries to help them meet net zero but this does nothing to remove the carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere and needs to come out. Take a look at this graph here. It shows the rapid increase in the amount of carbon measured in our air over the last 60 years, directly warming our planet and changing our climate. So is there a way of reversing the damage we've already done by pulling some of that carbon dioxide back out of the atmosphere? One project in Morocco is planning to use algae in the middle of the desert. The world's oceans are home to tiny organisms called algae. In the right conditions, they multiply in the trillions, creating huge blooms that can be beautiful and extremely useful.
Well, algae actually already remove about half of all of the carbon removed in the world. Algae remove more carbon than forests. What if you could recreate what happens at sea on land? That's what one startup is doing in the Moroccan desert, growing huge ponds of algae that bloom constantly. They then dry it out and bury it underground. In their Hertfordshire lab, Brilliant Planet burn the dried algae to test how much carbon it stores. It's so salty, dry and acidic, they say it's effectively mummified, which is why it won't decay. Burying this algae is like locking away around 16 grams of carbon dioxide. Once they build their first commercial site, Brilliant Planet think that they can bury enough of this to offset the yearly emissions of around 20,000 people in the UK. But even if it works at scale, it will take a long time to get there and we will still need to urgently cut emissions. In the meantime, Brilliant Planet will sell its removals as a credit to businesses that want to offset their own pollution. But offsetting doesn't have the best reputation. We are part of really a new group of companies that are focusing on what we would call very high integrity carbon removal. We can easily verify it, measure it, so that when a company has emitted carbon and we say we will remove the same amount on your behalf, we can be very sure that we've actually done that. Is there a danger that this is a distraction from what we really need to be doing, which is cutting emissions? No, the primary focus does need to be on reducing emissions in the first place, but we are still going to have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and for those cases, we will need carbon removal. But many warn there is a real danger that we'll rely too much on offsetting, which will take too long to get right. Scaling up any technology quickly is risky, and if you just scale, scale, scale as fast as you possibly can, you're almost inevitably going to miss something. Having said that, we do need to move really fast. We are in a uh, climate emergency. An emergency we found ourselves in because every year emissions are still going up, making us more desperate for new technologies like this to work. Victoria Seabrook, Sky News. Another way of hoovering some of that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is a very long way from the desert because it involves plants and trees and it's called biochar, which is in effect a climate-friendly version of charcoal. And as our science correspondent Thomas Moore reports, it could also help increase the fertility of soil. So this is winter wheat. It was drilled back in October um, with a direct drill. In the soil of this research farm in Leicestershire, there is black gold. So what you got? So this is biochar. This was spread last October. It's similar to barbecue charcoal, but has a priceless quality. When spread on fields, the carbon in the charred wood could be stored in the ground for centuries to come. Biochar could help agriculture reach net zero. It did sound too good to be true, but like you said, we're open-minded and we've kind of got to take that opportunity to kind of show that we are willing to change, certainly as an industry and as a business. Wood releases carbon into the atmosphere when it rots or burns, but heating it in an oven purged of oxygen changes the chemical structure, locking up the carbon. The test for researchers is whether it works on a large scale. This is now incredibly stable, so if I rub that between my fingers, it's hardly crumbling. We can grow the tree. We capture the carbon through its life cycle, we add it to the land, we potentially get some benefits to our crops, and we're also sequestering that carbon that's important for helping combat climate change. Adding biochar has really helped to improve yields. In particular, it can do that, for example, by improving the amount of water the soil can hold, but it can also change the acidity of the soil, so it can increase it, and that makes the soil much more fertile and better for the crops to grow in. But could there be even more magic to making biochar? Biochar only contains a third of all the material that was originally in the wood. But here in Birmingham, they're looking at the two thirds that would normally be wasted. And part of that is a liquid. So at the bottom here is oil that could be upgraded to be used as a fuel in heating boilers and ship engines. On top is a vinegar that could be used for weed killer and a plant stimulator. The idea is to try and use every possible atom of carbon that was originally in the trees. The air is kept out of the unit by 
the airlock. Uh, the material is taken up through this chute. These pipes and heated chambers conceal a secret technique for making biochar and capturing the byproducts. Scientists at Aston University say it all adds up to make the process economically viable. We're trying to capture everything which is in there and make the maximum use of it so we get the best use of the carbon and also the best use of the, the products commercially because they need to be sustainable, which means commercially sustainable so they can also be scaled. 70% of Britain's land area is used for farming. If these large-scale tests of biochar prove successful, it is a vast opportunity to unleash nature's carbon capture and storage. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Leicestershire. So there is a lot of excitement over carbon capture and carbon removal, but many believe it's a dangerous distraction from actually cleaning up our industries and not emitting that carbon dioxide in the first place. We'll get stuck into that after the break. Welcome back to the show. Now, earlier on, we were looking at the various ways of reducing the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere by either capturing it from the chimneys and then storing it underground, hopefully, or actually pulling it down with biochar or algae. Well, with me to discuss all these different ideas is Chris Littlecott from the environmental think tank E3G. Chris, let's start with HiNet, that big project we looked at in Merseyside. They are actually saying they're going to retrofit carbon capture and storage on existing industries at an eye-watering cost. I mean, many, many billions. Do you think that will actually happen? <laughs> uh, I think we all need to see uh, how the Treasury steps up here in the UK. Um, the, the current approach that the UK government is taking is much better than the previous right. attempts that they've had. But one of the stumbling blocks in the past has been whether the Treasury will put its hand into its pocket for the scale of resources that have been requested. I mean, they are using this Italian oil and gas company, Eni, to do the storage. That's the plan. I mean, I, I, you tell me, what kind of record do Eni have when it comes to uh, climate change? So th this, is, this is part of the conundrum around how do, how do citizens and policymakers respond to the different industries and actors in the space. Any and many other oil and gas companies have wonderful technical experience. You know, putting CO2 underground is like taking oil and gas out in reverse. So with their engineering skills and their geological knowledge, they could really be a helpful part of the solution. But companies like Eni, also other British companies like BP and, and Shell, are, are still on a very pro-gas trajectory in their business cases and in their advocacy towards governments. So it's great to see these companies stepping up on CCS, but also they really do need to have a comprehensive approach which is reducing gas production in the first place rather than continuing to promote it. And to ensure that the leopard does genuinely change its spots, does that need enormous pressure from government, populations and not just in one country? Oh, absolutely. I, my, my sense is that we're moving much more to a space where we're going to have to talk about producer responsibility. It's not going to be enough for oil and gas companies and others to say, oh, well, we'd love to do this thing, but it's expensive and doesn't give us our returns. Please give us a load of subsidies. You know, that, that puts all of the pain on, on the public purse. We really need to see ways that policymakers can get those oil and gas companies to be making investments themselves because they have been yeah. you know, so central to the expansion of production of fossil fuels in the first place. With water, the water companies are responsible for the waste after it's been to our homes. Increasingly, with goods that we throw away, the producer has responsibility. With fossil fuels, they have no responsibility. We just let it waft into the atmosphere. You're saying that's got to change. Oh, absolutely. It's been incredibly easy and cheap for CO2 to be emitted to the atmosphere. Putting CO2 back underground is really difficult and expensive. We can do it. It's within uh, the bounds of our technical knowledge as a, as a species and as a set of companies that we have operating. But they actually have to be forced to a point to make those decisions to invest and make this happen. And if they prefer to do something better and cleaner, that's fine. But let's not let them con continue to put, kick the can down the road. I mean, I've been reporting on CCS for 20 years plus, but very little of it is still actually there. So this idea about hiding behind an idea does have some validity. Yes. I, where CCS started was very much around power sector. 
but we can already go back to 2009 here in the UK where Ed Miliband said, OK, no new coal power plants without CCS. And that really called the bluff of, of utility companies and others who were talking about future CCS, but as an excuse to build a new generation of coal power stations. And actually by forcing companies and project developers to really seriously think about whether they were going to take on the difficulty and the expense of CCS, we've then seen the outcome is that they've actually built renewables because they're better, cleaner, cheaper and quicker. Should we just say CCS is a, a dangerous distraction and we can get away without it? Can we reach net zero without it? I, I think that would be unwise, not only in terms of the technology tools that we need at our disposal in order to get to net zero uh, and can really drive that decarbonisation agenda, but also about how do we force these decisions and, and having available technologies doesn't mean that those technologies themselves will be, be used, but they can be overtaken by something better. If, if we don't change the frame of the argument, then we're, then we're going to let uh, companies off the hook and they will carry on as business as usual. Thanks very much Chris, such a fascinating issue. Well, we're going to move away from carbon capture now. Last week we were looking at bees and their role in pollination and particularly studies that show we may have so many honeybees they're affecting other pollinators. Well new research has shown the extraordinary importance of moths when it comes to pollinating, especially at night. So if you think of pollinators, you've probably got in mind bees, because we all know that we need to save the bees and there's a big pollinator collapse happening. But what we've discovered with our research is that actually the nighttime pollinators, moths, are also really important. We use camera traps to look at how often moths were visiting flowers. And what we're amazed to find is that actually, although more pollination is done during the day, that's largely because there's more time available. And at night, the moths are really busy doing that work. Now in the UK and further afield, many of our moths are declining and facing various threats. But there is still so much that we can all be doing to help support moths by providing important food sources and habitats for them throughout the year. Bramble is often looked down on as a bit of a pest, but it can provide a really important source of nectar and pollen throughout the summer. If we can allow patches of bramble to flourish in our parks, our gardens, our road verges and hedgerows, we can really provide huge benefits for our marvellous moths. So above all, love your moths. Well, that is it for now, but don't forget you can get your fix of all the environmental news you want by looking at the Sky News website or app, or you can scan the QR code that is on your screen right now. Next week, I'll be looking at the resurgence of European sleeper trains and even riding those romantic midnight rails myself. <laughs>